Hello and welcome to Kyogen's webinar today. My name is Jovi Chesnick and I am a Senior Global Market Manager here at Kyogen and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Uh, today we will be presenting Dr. Ryan Farr, who's a researcher at CSIRO at the Australian Center for Disease Preparedness. Um, before we begin, um, I have a few housekeeping things that I need to discuss with you. The first is uh, this disclaimer that I need to make you aware of. And basically this says that this is a Kaijin sponsored webinar and the views expressed here are those of the speaker and not necessarily those of Kaijin for any up-to-date licensing information and product specific disclaimers. Uh, see our uh, Kaijin kit instructions for use or the user operation manuals. And um, you can get those at www.kyogen.com on our website, or you can request them through our technical services team. So with that, I would like to then introduce Dr. Farr. Uh, Ryan then is a researcher um, who is studying the host response to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And in this particular webinar, he's looking specifically at microRNAs. And we are really excited to have you here, Ryan, to talk to us today. Thank you for joining us. G'day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And thank you to Kaijin for uh, inviting me to give this talk. And of course, a, a big thank you to the lovely Joby for that introduction. So I am going to be chatting to you a little bit about a uh, previous uh, publication that we've uh, just recently put out around microRNA expression in circulation in COVID-19 patients. But I'm also going to have a little bit of a chat to you about um, microRNAs and the basis of why they're good biomarkers. And I'm also uh, putting a little bit of extra data towards the end uh, of some very recent stuff that we're excited to share with you as well. So. Uh, I'm going to get into it. Um, so first of all, yes, I, I work at the CSI Australian Centre for Disease Preparedness. So we are a high containment virology laboratory and we're located right down at the bottom end of uh, mainland Australia, right near Melbourne. We're about an hour outside of Melbourne in a regional area. So this is us. We are a nice big concrete box. Um, and if it looks like all of these houses around here are staying well clear, that's kind of for good reason. We do house um, quite a lot of highly pathogenic viruses. And we're one of the few um, labs or institutes in the world that's able to work with cellular and molecular biology right the way up to large animal uh, research in a BSL-2 right the way to BSL-4 containment level. So we work with a, a large range of different viruses, uh, including uh, highly pathogenic influenza at BSL-3, um, rabies virus at BSL-3 as well. And so this is, this is a virus that I've done quite a bit of work in uh, previously. Uh, we do also do some work in the Ebola and the BSL-4 level, so the highest level of containment. And of course, we work with everyone's favorite, SARS-CoV-2 and BSL-3 or 4, depending on the application there. So at the centre of all the work that we do uh, is our biocontainment. So you can see a couple of my colleagues there, uh, Sean and Mai Lang, um, in their BSL-4 uh, suits doing some of the work uh, at that highest level of containment with their um, dedicated air supply there. What also uh, keeps uh, us safe when we're doing our work is the high level of engineering that's uh, throughout our institute. So here's a, a bit of a diagram of the uh, Institute of ACDP. And what you can see is that we need at least sort of uh, one, two, three, four different levels of engineering to actually make one level of labs run. Um, and so we, we're very reliant and very appreciative of all the engineers that work with us. Um, there's a lot of uh, filtering of air in and out and a lot of treatment of any sort of waste product that comes out. And if you want to learn more about our facility, you can head to sorrow.au um, and have a look at our showcase for this particular institute. So we'll get into COVID-19. So I think 
um, everyone should know what COVID-19 is now. I think uh, um, everybody's still being quite affected by this uh, disease and by this uh, pandemic. Um, but if you have been living under a rock, I will uh, take a bit of time just to have a chat to you about what it is. So COVID-19 or coronavirus disease 2019 is a respiratory disease uh, caused by SARS-CoV-2, which is distinct from SARS-CoV-1, which caused the SARS outbreak back in about 2002. So what's interesting about this particular disease is that it ranges really from asymptomatic, um, you know, you have no idea that you've actually been infected, right the way through to acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS and unfortunately death. And as of about September this year, and there's greater than 200 million cases and four and a half million deaths worldwide. So this pandemic has had really far reaching impacts right across the globe. Now, I'm, I'm part of a team known as Host Response, and as the name kind of implies, we're pretty interested in the host response to infectious disease. And this is particularly interesting in terms of COVID-19 uh, because the outcome of this infection really varies wildly between no disease right the way through to severe disease and death. And there's been a lot of research and a lot of interest in why this occurs, why this, you know, large... Um, variability in the outcomes of this infection. And what we found is that the host response to this infection really plays a very central role in determining the disease outcome. And a lot of the previous research that has come out is focused really squarely on the pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as IL-6, IL-8, TNF-alpha, and IL-1 beta. And we found that they're elevated in severe COVID-19 cases, and they're considered harmful because they... they uh, respond in this almost cytokine storm, this hyper-aggressive immune reaction, uh, which causes damage to the host. But what we're interested in is, can we look at not just the pro-inflammatory cytokines, but other host responses that could have a diagnostic or prognostic potential? Um, some of these uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines have been published with, um, you know, moderate to good um, diagnostic or prognostic potential, and we're trying to see if we can look at other molecules there as well. So the current diagnostics for COVID-19, the gold standard test uh, is a reverse transcription uh, PCR, which really targets in on that viral genome which is, you know, it's a, it's a very good test, but it requires a relatively high viral load to accurately detect infection. And this, this means that it, it um, shows, it can show poor sensitivity, um, particularly in the early stages of the, of the disease, as that um, virus is starting to replicate um, and not quite at that levels that can be detected uh, by that PCR test. In fact, there was a paper that came out just recently that showed that the sensitivity can actually be as low as 30 to 40 percent in symptomatic patients. Luckily, that's not the norm. Um, but there is high rates of false negative, particularly in that pre and asymptomatic period uh, where that virus itself is not easily detectable. And as I said, what we're looking at is can we identify a host response rather than looking at the virus itself to actually identify these COVID-19 cases with more sensitivity and more accuracy. So we work in a field of study uh, focused really squarely at host biomarkers. And these are indirect measures of health using some sort of biological marker. And there's a lot of examples out there um, in medicine currently um, you know, cardiac troponin in blood, a measure of, of heart attack, uh, blood glucose level as a measure of diabetes, and of course, pathogen-specific antibodies um, as an indicator of infection. So our uh, particular group, we like to look at circulating biomarkers, and obviously this is my beautiful drawing of a blood vessel, um, but we look at circulating biomarkers in basically any biological fluid you can think of. Um, and when we look at the current research, a lot of people are looking at uh, mainly three different classes of biomarkers, although there are others that people look at. And these are proteins, including uh, antibody responses, um, cell-free DNA, uh, including epigenetic modifications or you know, DNA methylation of cell-free DNA, and of course, microRNA. And it's really these um, small non-coding uh, RNAs that's a, a main focus of our particular team. And it's, it's been a focus of mine probably for the, uh, probably the past six or so years, ever since I, I completed my PhD. 
So I'm going to spend just a little bit of time chatting about microRNAs, particularly for those of you who may not know what microRNAs are. Um, I kind of always tell people that they are my favorite molecules. Uh, so I like to always have a bit of a chat about what these things are and what they do uh, in your body. So when I have a chat about um, microRNA function, I like to go right back to the very basics. So the core of molecular biology is that we start off with a DNA, which is a blueprint, in this case, a, a beautiful blueprint of a little Lego man. Uh, and when we want to express or build a particular section of that blueprint, we take a photocopy, which is our RNA or our messenger RNA. We then hand it over to our ribosomal builder, which then produces the final protein product. Now, if this um, DNA RNA protein, as I said, it's the, the core tenant of uh, molecular biology. If this is kind of left unchecked, you end up with more protein product than you actually want. The builders will keep building it as long as that RNA hangs around. So there's lots of different mechanisms to actually regulate this process, um, but one of the main ones um, that is, is a real central player in um, cellular development and function is microRNAs. And they really come in as a bit of a shredder. Uh, of course, not this sort of shredder, this sort of shredder. Uh, that was for my Teenage Ninja Turtle fans. Um, so the microRNAs um, are able to actually uh, bind and knock down the messenger RNA, which then leads to a, a reduction in the final and in this way, they help to regulate that endogenous gene expression. Now, of course, it's much more um, complicated in real life and in cellular biology than you know, playing with Lego. Um, so what we can see here is that the, the uh, microRNAs are uh, transcribed in these multi-hairpin uh, primary microRNA structures, which are then cleaved into these pre-microRNA structures, exported out of the nucleus, cleaved again by DISA into the mature microRNAs that we can see over here. And then there, one of the strands is incorporated into the RNA-induced silencing complex. And this is an argonaut protein complex that uses that mRNA to identify the target mRNA, uh, microRNA to identify the target mRNA. And when they find it, they can either cause um, translational repression through imperfect complementarity, and this means that uh, the argonaut complex binds and will not let it pass through the ribosome and won't let it actually translate into protein, or there's perfect complementarity, which results in mRNA cleavage and um, removal. Now, why am I talking about these uh, in terms of biomarkers if they've got such an important role within the cell? Well, what we've actually found over the years is that um, these microRNAs can actually be released into circulation. And this could be either due to cell stress or cell death and a, a reduction in the membrane integrity. Uh, they can be released either as naked um, microRNA uh, molecules, or they can be bound to lipoproteins or argonaut proteins, as we can see over here to the right. Um, but they can also be uh, packaged up and released in these uh, extracellular vesicles uh, known as exosomes. And this is an active um, process and it can be used as cell-to-cell -cell communication. Now, what's really cool about these particular molecules is that they show remarkable stability within circulation. They are resistant to degradation um, by endogenous nucleases. They can withstand multiple freeze-thaw cycles, changes in temperature, changes in pH. They're quite stable and, and good in terms of um, you know, bi diagnostic biomarkers. We've also seen that microRNAs are present and detectable in basically any biological fluid you could, you could imagine. And I've extracted them from pretty much every biological fluid you can imagine, uh, including urine, tears, saliva, you know, cerebral spinal fluid, obviously serum and plasma, um, which makes them a really good sort of peripheral uh, bio, biomarker um, for any sort of localized disease. Now, there are a couple of other benefits of using microRNAs as uh, biomarkers, which I'll, which I'll go into now. So one of the main um, benefits of using these over, say, detecting the, the virus is looking at early detection. And what we can see over here on the right-hand side is that as time progresses and as the replication of the virus really kicks off or the pathogen really kicks off, 
we often see in a lot of diseases that the options for treatment start to decline. Um, and really, the earlier, the better in a lot of these infections. Um, and that's, uh, and what we see a lot in these sort of infections is that the, in the early stages of these infections, the diagnostics often fail. They're not great, particularly in that incubation period um, before the replication of the pathogen really kicks off. And this is either due to um, the diagnostic targeting the pathogen, and it, as I said, that needs relatively high replication to be um, able to easily be found. And this is, again, the case in, in COVID-19, or they're targeting something like antibodies against uh, the, the pathogen, which takes at least a week, but generally longer uh, to appear and be easily detectable. In contrast, microRNA changes are actually detectable within three hours um, that we've, we've measured them in vitro and 24 hours in vivo after infection. And, um, you know, this data came from a publication that we, that our team uh, put out in about 2013. And what was interesting about this particular work in Hendra virus is that we were actually able to, to measure the changes of these microRNAs days before we were able to detect the virus. So they're rapidly changing and easily detectable. Another benefit of microRNA uh, biomarkers is that it, it enables us to really drill down to the specific pathogen that causes the disease. And this, this is essentially the case that many diseases share very, either very similar symptoms or, in fact, some diseases can be caused by multiple pathogens. Um, and there was a publication back out in uh, 2011 that had a look at hand, foot and mouth disease, which is caused by multiple different um, viruses. And they were actually able to use microRNAs to distinguish between two causative agents, Coxsackie virus 16 and enterovirus 71. We've actually been able to drill down even further than that and have a look at viral strain specific responses. Um, and in this particular case, this is unpublished data. This is in some of the rabies work that I've done. Uh, it's now under review and hopefully will be out soon. Um, where we can look at different strains of LISA virus actually elicit different microRNA responses. And this is really important when the treatment depends on the pathogen. And if we, if we take into account um, COVID-19, obviously it's a respiratory disease. There are many viruses that can cause respiratory diseases. One of the major ones is influenza. Uh, and knowing whether it's uh, COVID-19 or influenza really makes a big impact on that treatment, on that clinical decisions, on how that patient is treated. Um, you know, and particularly in the case of influenza, they have uh, Tamiflu and, and other um, ways of actually treating that infection there as well. All right, so we'll get into the meat of the study. Uh, this is uh, talking about the COVID-19 microRNA study that we completed. Uh, it was published uh, fairly recently in PLOS Pathogens. Um, and the aim of this particular study, it had, it had sort of three aims. The first one was to identify any sort of changes in circulating, and in this case, it was plasma um, microRNAs in human patients with COVID-19 compared to healthy controls. Uh, investigate whether a microRNA biomarker signature could be used to identify or predict um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And then we went on to validate these results in an animal model. So first up, we took plasma from 10 COVID-19 patients and 10 uh, healthy age and gender match controls. And we can also see that the COVID-19 patients, uh, almost half of them had to uh, or required supplementary oxygen therapy there as well. And what was really good about this particular cohort of patients was that they were um, sampled longitudinally. So we were actually able to assess some of these samples over time to see you know, um, whether the biomarker signature faded away, whether it changed over time. So most of the work that I'm going to show you here was really focused on this V1, the, the, the very earliest visit um, that was taken from these particular individuals. So we're looking at an acute and early phase uh, microRNA response. So all of the samples that we collected from all of these patients went through microRNA sequencing. And if anybody's done microRNA sequencing before, you'll know that there are a few sequencing hurdles if you want to um, 
have a look at these particular molecules. And one of them, uh, particularly in the case of circulation, is you do tend to get a very low RNA yield from circulation, and this can make it quite difficult with you know a lot of your traditional um, library preparation kits to actually get enough to generate a nice complete library. They're also quite a small or quite a short RNA species, and this has kind of necessitated a lot of um, gel excision to try and kind of cut out the size of RNA that you want to then go down into the um, cDNA library preparation. So, of course, this is a Kyogen-sponsored uh, webinar. We use the Kyoseq microRNA library kit. Uh, it's a two-day protocol. It was, it was actually yeah, surprisingly easy to do. Um, there was no sort of sense of, of uh, gel size selection, which made my life a little bit easier. Uh, and I was actually able to tweak the protocol uh, with a lot of help from uh, the Kyogen technical support to kind of tweak it to my needs, which I'm very appreciative of. And this resulted in quite a lot of very nice data. Um, so here we can see that we, um, we sliced out uh, all the reads that were about 18 to 26 nucleotides long, really to capture those microRNA species uh, there as well. Um, not, there's not a huge amount of um, unmapped reads that you can see there at the top, which is really nice to see. And a lot of the too short or too long often come from other uh, RNA species, particularly the too long. We often see a lot of peewee RNAs, which are, you know, 30 nucleotides or so. Um, and so uh, that's where a lot of those uh, reads are coming from. But for all of our samples, we were getting, you know, in the tens of millions of reads to work with, which was really nice to see. So first step was to have a look at the differential expression. So what is actually changing in the circulation of these patients? And what we found is about 55 microRNAs of a total of approximately 800 that were detected uh, were significantly altered using a false discovery rate of less than 0.05 um, using DEC normalization um, within uh, COVID-19 patients. And it's kind of a relatively even split. We get about 30 that are downregulated, uh, 20 that are upregulated, and five which were upregulated but just weren't quite over that twofold change. Now, we went along and obviously did uh, qPCR validation on a few of these markers just to give us confidence that what we were seeing in the NGS was um, absolutely uh, you know, a reflection of what we were uh, actually seeing and confidence in that NGS data. Now, when we actually had a look at these individual microRNAs, we found that our most upregulated microRNA was MER31, which has a real established role in inflammation, and our most significantly downregulated microRNA is MER766, which had an anti-inflammatory role. And so what we can actually see is a role for these microRNA responses in COVID patients uh, in terms of inflammation. And that kind of tracks with a lot of the previous data, which has shown these changes in these pro-inflammatory um, cytokines. In fact, we, we were able to access some data from these particular patients around um, their cytokine changes. And we're able to validate that, in fact, we did see a significant increase in IL-6 there as well. Now, if we take all 55 of those differentially expressed microRNAs, and we put them into a principal component analysis, we can see that there is really nice separation between these two groups. That's really nice. We see that uh, the microRNA responses are giving us this separation uh, between the groups. But in terms of a diagnostic use, this is pretty unrealistic. No diagnostic lab is going to be running 55 separate tests to tell whether you have COVID. It's just, it's not going to work. So we kind of thought, how are we going to bring 55 down to a manageable level? How are we going to figure out what are the most important microRNAs uh, for detecting or predicting COVID-19? So we turned uh, to machine learning. Um, and this is a, a branch of artificial intelligence. And if you actually go out and Google machine learning, you get some fantastic uh, images that are always in blue for some reason of, you know, circuitry with you know, human faces or um, minds melded together. Or my particular favorite is this wonderful uh, pensive looking robot um, pouring over, um, uh, you know, 
different mathematical equations. But really, when you think about, um, when you learn about what machine learning really is, this is probably more accurate. Uh, it's a big pile of maths, a big pile of linear algebra that you're able to actually pour in your data, um, you know, uh, change the coefficients of the equation and then see how well it works. And if it doesn't work very well, you're able to kind of keep working with it, keep tweaking it uh, until it starts to look right, until that model is performing how you uh, hope. Now, a lot of people are worried about machine learning. You know, machine learning is not Skynet. Uh, oftentimes, particularly when you're first starting, this is the kind of results that you're going to get. Um, this is a neural network, which is a more advanced um, machine learning algorithm. And obviously, you can see here that it's not doing so well in the prediction space. All right, so I used a process known as supervised machine learning. And there's really two parts uh, to this approach. The first part is to provide labeled data or training data to the machine learning uh, algorithm. And in this case, in the example on the screen there, it's cats or not cats. Uh, in my case, it was infected or not infected. Uh, and the machine then learns what the different uh, markers or yeah, what, what the different uh, features that are important to distinguishing one from another. And then once it's done that, you can then test it by giving it unlabeled data. So data it's never seen before, it has no idea uh, whether these are cats or not cats, or infected or uninfected, um, and it has to then predict which group those unlabeled data fit into. And then you can evaluate how well it did, you can have a look at its accuracy and its, its sensitivity and things like that. But one of the main uh, problems with this when you're talking about you know, lower sample numbers and a lot of microRNAs, remembering that you know, we, we found uh, about 800 detectable microRNAs within patients, is how do we actually bring it down to a, the, the right amount or the optimal amount of microRNAs to enable us to, one, have not too many molecules for a diagnostic test, but also still have really high levels of accuracy. So what I did is I created a model with all of the microRNAs, all 800, and then we're able to rank these microRNAs on their importance, or how much did they contribute to this model's performance. I then took out the very top, the most important microRNA, and randomly split the data into, again, that training and testing. It was randomly done into 70% training, 30% testing. And then I trained the model, tested the model, and then evaluated how well it performed just on that one top microRNA. And of course, it's not science if you don't record the results, right? And then I'd go back, and I do this a thousand times to make sure that I'm really confident in the evaluation of that model. And once I've done all of this, I go right the way back and I add in the next microRNA. So the next time I do it with the top two microRNAs, go through this process, you know, assess it a thousand times, record the results. And in this iterative process, we start to get in a bit of an idea about as we add in more microRNAs, what is that doing to the accuracy of the model? And where do we get to a point where it is the optimal level of microRNAs for our predictive um, you know, model? And so when we actually have a look at um, machine learning, there's, there's a few different results metrics uh, that we look at. And the main one, obviously, is accuracy. How many of those predictions were correct? Now, this is probably your default metric for a lot of things. Um, but there are certain situations where accuracy may not be the greatest one. If you have something where 99% of your tests are expected to be negative and 1% are expected to be positive, you could just call them all negative and you'd have a 99% accurate model. It's not always the best measure. So we also look at things like precision, which is how many of the predicted positives were actually positive or your true positive rate. Recall, which is how many of the true positives did the model find? And this is also called sensitivity. So when you're trying to compare these two. And the receiver operating characteristic area under the curve, or ROC AUC. And this is really just a very succinct metric to describe the overall diagnostic ability of a binary or a one versus another infected and non-infected. Cats, not cats, whatever sort of classifier you want to talk about. 
So what we can see here is the results of that um, feature selection or that microRNA selection. And we can see that even just starting with one microRNA, the top microRNA gave us actually above 90% accuracy. But once we hit three microRNAs, that's where we see our optimal. And these are the three microRNAs that form that signature. Uh, and we can see that it's really close to 100% accurate, um, precise and, and uh, sensitive there. And kind of adding in more and more microRNAs really doesn't improve uh, the model very much at all. So going from 55 differentially expressed microRNAs down to three uh, in a machine learning. model. What's really interesting about these guys, these particular microRNAs is that this they're not the most abundant. One is quite um, high abundance, so MERGE423. Uh, um, one is kind of middling, and MER195 is not low, but it's you know on the lower end of the scale there. Uh, what we also see is they're not the most differentially ex uh, expressed either. We have some that are, you know, with one that's down, two that's up, but they're not, you know, sitting out here right on the fringes. Um, and when we actually have a look at the microRNAs, only two of them actually came up in the differential expression analysis. So MER23A uh, looks like it's uh, downregulated, but it's non-significant, uh, whereas the other two are upregulated. And so this, it's an interesting comparison between what's found um, via uh, the machine learning versus what is in the machine uh, learning model there as well. So when we actually have a look at how well this um, predictive signature works, uh, after that sort of a thousand random iterations, we actually get about a 99.9% .9 accuracy, 99.8% uh, precision, and again, 99.9% .9 recall or sensitivity uh, using just those three microRNAs. And when we actually plot this uh, using a PCA, we see a really nice separation uh, between those two groups. And what we can see here as well is this has the probability of each of these samples being classified as infected with COVID-19. What we can see is that the healthy is you know, basically 0% probability. COVID-19 is 100% po um, probability. And that probability only starts to kind of waver right near that decision line, which is this black line that you can see uh, dividing those two groups. So it was a highly confident model. What was interesting is then when we could look at the further visits, uh, visit two, three, and four of these individuals, uh, as they started getting better, as they started uh, clearing this disease, uh, most of the samples started um, congregating and, and grouping back with the healthy controls down here. Now, there is an obvious exception to this rule, um, visit two, three, and four, um, denoted here by the uh, hash symbol. Um, these were from one individual who was in ICU and was actually sick through all visits. And their um, samples clustered more with the infected signature. So this um, kind of suggests that it's a, a signature of really early disease that starts to fade away over time as people start to clear that disease. All right, so we, we found this um, particular signature in um, you know, a smallish number of patients. And we wanted to then go, okay, can we validate this using an animal model? And we used ferrets as the uh, preferred animal model. Um, they're used quite significantly in terms of respiratory uh, viral infections, uh, particularly influenza. <clears throat> So we used a ferret model where 20 ferrets uh, were uh, intranasally inoculated with SARS-CoV-2 uh, and they were serially sacrificed on different days. And on each one of these days, we also had uh, nasal swabs, washes and bloods taken. And what we can see, um, so this is the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, qPCR results. We can see that even from day three, um, most of them show uh, positivity, particularly in the turbinate uh, and the nasal wash and oral swabs. But this starts to decrease over the days. In fact, by day 14, it's only detectable in the lymph nodes and not anywhere else. So to really validate the human microRNA signature, we investigated serum from ferrets that were either uninfected, uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2, or just to kick up the dif uh, difficulty a, a little bit, uh, infected with influenza or H1N1 strain. 
what we can see is when we uh, put together a PCA based on these three microRNAs, we can already see that they're starting to kind of cluster out pretty nicely. We've got our uninfected over here in blue, our H1N1 down there in orange, and the SARS here, V2 infected um, uh, ferrets there in green. And you can see that they are actually starting to cluster out without doing anything uh, to them apart from looking at those three microRNAs. And when we actually just look at um, ferrets infected with SARS-CoV-2 versus those that are uninfected, we get again about over 99% accuracy and actually 100% recall and lock AUC. And we get this really nice, uh, really confident model between um, these two groups. It was really nice to see, kind of validating what we had seen in the human cohort. But again, I guess one of the, the questions we get asked a lot is, can this differentiate between multiple different infections? And that's why we brought in the influenza, the H1N1 infected uh, ferrets there as well. And the good news is it can. So uh, we had a look at, again, using these three microRNAs to uh, assess whether we could uh, differentiate between uninfected, SARS-CoV-2 infected and H1N1 infected ferrets. And the accuracy of this is still pretty high. It's about 95% accurate in determining uh, or in predicting whether these samples uh, belong to one of these three groups. And what you can see is actually uh, one of the misclassifications that's done there, which would be pulling down this accuracy score, it's misclassifying one of the H1N1 infected ferrets as SARS-CoV-2 that you can see down there on the, on the white dot there. All right, so I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes uh, having a bit of a chat about some of the uh, newest data that we've um, started to put together. Um, so oftentimes what we get asked about is what about non-invasive nasal swabs? Um, wouldn't that be better than plasma? You know, this is the, the normal test that, that people get done. It's the one that feels like it's tickling the back of your brain. Um, but this is the normal way of, of detecting COVID-19. Can we do the same thing here. Would upper respiratory microRNAs allow co for COVID-19 uh, identification? And if so, would those signatures or would those microRNAs that are used for identification, would they be the same as what we identified in the plasma? So what we did is we collected nasal swabs uh, from uh, 12 COVID-19 patients and eight uninfected symptom-free controls. And interestingly, we did find, again, when we just took this same approach of identifying these microRNAs, feeding them into a machine learning model, that, again, the optimal was sitting up there at about three microRNAs. We actually ended up getting 100% uh, accuracy, precision recall, and rock AUC across the board, which was surprising, but absolutely fantastic. Um, and again, we get this really nice separation um, and here we have a, a PCA plot between the two different groups based again on just three microRNAs. But what was interesting is that they are not the same three microRNAs. These are a, a completely different signature in the upper respiratory tract uh, that allows this differentiation between um, COVID-19 and control or, or uninfected uh, individuals. Again, we see two that are significantly different. So um, you can see here 6 to 8 and 93 show, uh, uh, show up in the differential expression analysis, but 30C does not. Even though there's a trend, it is non-significant in differential expression analysis. So kind of showing you that we can still do it. It's still a 3 microRNA signature. It still works phenomenally well but it's a different set of microRNAs and it may be just localized uh, to that particular sample type. And if you wanna learn more about uh, this particular research, uh, we do have a preprint available on Research Square. It's under uh, review at the moment and hopefully we'll get that published out as well. All right, so getting into the summary, uh, what have we done and what's next? Uh, so circulating microRNAs, uh, respond to SARS-CoV-2 infection. We found a large proportion of microRNAs that did change in response, so 55 differentially expressed microRNAs. 
we found a signature of three plasma microRNAs that can independently classify COVID-19 with 99.9% accuracy. And this signature is actually robust in an animal model there as well with about 99.7% accuracy uh, looking between COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, and uninfected ferrets and can actually distinguish between uninfected SARS-CoV-2 and seasonal influenza or H1N1 infected ferrets with about 95% accuracy. And this includes cases uh, later on in the uh, disease progression where nasal swab PCR results were actually negative. And we found a different set of three microRNA signature that uh, classifies COVID-19 with 100% accuracy using that sort of nasal swab media. Now, what's next? Um, we're looking into biomarker validation in larger patient cohorts. Uh, a lot of these, you know, obviously, smaller sample numbers. Um, Australia did quite well, at least in the initial parts of this pandemic. Uh, so samples weren't super easy to come by. We're hoping to, to pad those numbers out and really get into that biomarker validation and have a look at sort of clinical sensitivity and specificity. And we really want to have a look at, we're really interested in looking in those pre and asymptomatic patients to really see how well this signature can work in that cohort as well. Uh, and we're also looking into commercial partnerships for translation, either as a lab-based test or point of care test. And of course, uh, a very big thank you to all the people who helped out in this particular study. Um, I will definitely acknowledge Cam Stewart, or Cameron Stewart down there, uh, who's the team lead for host response here at CSIRO. Um, Chris Cowled, who helped with a lot of the bioinformatics work um, and actually trained me to use Python. So all of this stuff wouldn't have been without his help. Uh, and of course, Chrissy Roots, uh, who does a lot of the high containment virology work. So a big thank you to all those guys. Um, we worked a lot with the Peter Doherty, Alfred Health, uh, who uh, enabled us to actually access these samples. And of course, the Dangerous Pathogens team, which is Glenn Goff and Vassan in particular, uh, who helped us out with the, uh, the ferret infection work as well. So with that, I'm gonna leave you um, Say a big thank you uh, to everybody for listening. Uh, and again, thank you to uh, Kaijin for, for inviting me to give this seminar. If anybody's interested uh, or has any extra questions after this, you're, you're more than welcome to, to drop me a line. I've got my details down there, Twitter handle, and we actually have our uh, website that we've just put up um, if you want to learn more about the work that we do. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ryan. That was really interesting. Um, it, I find it incredible to have three signatures like that that could be so so predictive and then to be able to differentiate also between that and the flu, which is I find just really interesting. Um, I do want to invite our uh, attendees now, if you'd like to find your chat box or your question box on your desktop, to go ahead and type in a question if you have a question for Ryan. And we'll give you just a few seconds to do that. And then we'll start our Q&A session for this evening. Um, we have a first question here. How did you choose your machine learning model? Uh, that's a good one. Yeah. So anybody who's ever been involved uh, in machine learning at all knows that there's a multitude of different machine learning models out there. And it can be quite difficult to pick one, to go for what, what is the one that I want to do? How do I um, set up my data so that it works well, that it, the model uh, works well? And so what we've actually done is, and you know, this is a lot of the work that I've done uh, with Chris Cowlid there, is to set up a data analysis pipeline. And so what this pipeline does is that we feed in the data and then it tries to look at multiple different machine learning models. It also looks at different things like whether we PCA transform the data, how we scale it. There's so many different tweaks that you can do to this analysis. And as it runs through this data analysis pipeline, we're able to generate a report at the end, which shows us all the different options. It shows us, um, you know, how many microRNAs, uh, what particular model, how we scale the data, how we work with the data. And so we can sort of have a look at that uh, report at the end of all that 
and say, okay, we want three microRNAs or five microRNAs. Uh, we also want it to be PCA transformed. We want to use logistic regression or support vector machine or K nearest neighbors or whatever model we want to use. But by doing this, and this is kind of the power of, of learning those kind of bioinformatics skills and pipeline skills, is that you can investigate all of these different things all at once. Uh, it, it's not, not a case of going into the lab, having to troubleshoot and go backwards and forwards. Um, as you can tell, I'm, I'm a bit of a bioinformatic convert here. At the moment. <laughs> but it means that you're able to kind of look at all these different variations and pick the best one that works for you and your data. And in this case, a lot of the times it's the simplest. Um, oftentimes we, we end up using a, a logistic regression model, which is fairly simple, but it seems to be fairly powerful. But at least we have all those options to look at everything. Great, thank you so much. Um, we have another question here. Could this microRNA signature be used to detect asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic infections? Yeah, excellent. So this is a lot of the work that we want to do in the future. Um, we are hoping to you know, recruit patients and get those sort of longitudinal pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic uh, samples as we go along. But based on our previous research in other viruses, um, we're pretty confident that this signature will work. Um, I think I mentioned there one of the publications that we did back in 2013, and this was in Hendra virus. This was looking at the changes in circulating microRNAs uh, in response to that Hendra virus. And what we were actually able to see is that the changes in circulating microRNAs were detectable and easily detectable days before we actually found that virus. And this is because they, they change really rapidly in response to stimuli. And this may not be you know, infectious disease, this could be stress, this could be um, heat, this could be all, all sorts of different things can, can change the response uh, of microRNA expression. But because it acts so rapidly, you know, in cell culture, it's sort of within that three hours, we can start seeing uh, extracellular, so, um, circulating microRNAs changing, and within an in vivo system in animals or, or humans, we can generally see them start to change within that 24-hour period. And so what we're hoping for is to validate this signature in those individuals who have been infected but may not have developed symptoms. And there, again, is some, some extra data that um, I'm hoping to publish. I've got too many, too many papers to put together. Um, that we're hoping to publish that shows, again, this real pre-symptomatic changes in these microRNAs uh, in viral infections. And so um, we're really confident that, we, that we're able to do that as well. Awesome, awesome. Um, another question here, why weren't all of the uh, microRNAs in the COVID signature uh, differentially expressed? Yeah, it's something that we see uh, fairly regularly. So I guess there's, there's, a, there's a fairly big difference between uh, differential expression analysis and machine learning analysis. So your differential expression analysis looks at each individual microRNA and just compares just that one. It's known as a univariate analysis. It just looks at one variable and it looks at the two groups and it says statistically, how likely are we to see this change by random chance. Um, and then it goes through and says, okay, you know, within that threshold, that's statistically significant. And it moves on to the next one and the next one and the next one. But when you're looking at sort of 800 odd microRNAs, it's got to control for doing 800 different statistical tests. And that, you know, that ends up being a lot of p-value adjustment. And sometimes that p-value adjustment can be too stringent. And so you end up cutting off a lot that um, show a trend and that, you know, in the unadjusted p-value are actually significant, but because of these p-value adjustment become unsignificant or non-significant, I should say. With the machine learning model, it doesn't really take that into account. It looks at the expression of all of the microRNAs within the model and how they relate to one another. So this is a multivariate analysis. And so this looks at not just one in isolation, but it looks at all, in this case, three of those microRNAs and the relationship between one that may go up, one that may go down, one that may not change all that much. 
Um, but how those then feed into that uh, equation, which underlies the, the machine learning model, um, and how they all sort of fit together. And for me, it's more reflective of what's happening at a biological level. Um, if we're you know, infected with viruses, if we're stressed in a particular way, um, we don't just see one gene change or one microRNA change in isolation to everything else and everything else staying the same. There's always this um, interaction between the microRNAs, between the gene expression, between the proteins, between the virus. And so looking at it in that multivariate analysis enables us to kind of get a bit more power. It also gives us a bit more of a biological insight into what's happening uh, in this you know, biological system. Excellent, thank you. Um, I think we have time maybe for one more question. Um, this person says, what about vaccinated people? Would they show up as positive using this test? Mm. So this is something that a lot of diagnostic tests have struggled with over the years. Um, that differentiation between current infection and vaccinated uh, individuals. And particularly when you're looking at tests that are uh, looking into antibodies and those sort of um, responses that, you know, can, can crop up because of vaccination or because of um, current infection, sometimes it can be very difficult to, to split out those two. Now, what we've seen, again, um, I don't have the data for COVID-19, but obviously with, with more and more people getting vaccinated uh, and our rates are pumping up here in Australia, which is fantastic, um, we'll be able to, to hopefully do that uh, work. But in our previous work, and again, in Hendra virus, which is a highly pathogenic virus, we've seen that vaccinated um, individuals show up the same as uninfected individuals in terms of their microRNA response. Because unlike your antibody response, microRNAs don't need to hang around um, for, you know, the, the, the life. They're not an immune, well, they, you know, they impact on the immune response, but they're not like antibodies, which are, you know, hanging around to give you that protection. They are often short-term things. They respond to uh, stimuli, in this case, infection. Um, and so we're actually able to split out those two and, and have a look at it uh, have a look at those those vaccinated individuals coming up as uninfected individuals. And so we're really confident that by looking at the microRNA signatures that we're able to, to also um, not get confused with vaccinated individuals because they're two slightly different things. They're looking at two, two uh, different classes of molecules. So I hope that, hope that answers that question. Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to tell our audience, if you did not get your question answered um, during this session, or if you go back to your lab bench and maybe tomorrow, think about some questions that you might have for us, please feel free to contact us at kayawebinars at kayagen.com. And that address is showing on your screen right now. And we'll be happy to get back to you with an answer. Um, so again, I would like to uh, thank so much, Ryan, for just a, a very impressive uh, presentation today and some really interesting data and I think insights into COVID. Um, I want to thank our audience for joining us today. And uh, this, I think, then concludes today's webinar presentation. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.